We turn now to 1 Corinthians and chapter 1 and verse 12. We were considering one of the manifestations of carnality in the church at Corinth in our study last week. And that was that they were following human leaders. If we want to understand what it means to be a carnal Christian, the first letter to the Corinthians is the best book in the New Testament to study. The first letter of Paul to the Corinthians is a manifestation of the characteristics of the carnal Christian. We could put that as a title to the whole letter. The characteristics of a carnal Christian. And right at the top of the list is the following of human leaders. Paul, Apollos, and Peter had all ministered in Corinth. And there were certain people who liked Paul's ministry for various things that they saw in it. There were some others who appreciated Apollos perhaps for his eloquence. And others perhaps who were appreciated Peter for his simplicity, for he was only a fisherman. And there were still others who were super spiritual and who said, we're the only ones who belong to Christ. That's the point of the last part of verse 12. When they said, I am of Christ, it doesn't mean that that was wrong, but they were claiming to be exclusively belong to Christ. And like the Living Bible says, some say that they alone are the true followers of Christ. That's another form of exclusiveness where we don't follow human leaders but claim to be exclusive. So there are at least two dangers that we see here in verse 12. One is the following of human leaders and the other is where we claim that we are exclusively Christ's and that other people who may have some defects in them do not belong to Christ. These are two dangers, two cliffs, both of which we are to avoid. And I mentioned how many Christian leaders make this mistake of allowing people to be attached to them. A person who is attached to a Christian leader rather than to the head, Jesus Christ, is bound to be carnal in his life. And it's quite likely that a leader who allows people to be attached to him is himself carnal. A true man of God will never, never allow people to be attached to him. He will lead them to be attached to the head, even Christ. And he will not allow those who accept his ministry to become exclusive, to think that they alone belong to Christ. There may be things lacking in other believers, but they will accept them as believers in Christ, even if there are things lacking. Verse 13, Paul says, Has Christ been divided? Are you saying that Christ has been broken up into many pieces? That's the point. No, that's not possible. There is only one body. Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Neither Peter nor Apollos. And there we see Paul trying his best to shake off these people who wanted to follow him. You were not baptized in the name of Paul, were you? Then he says, how dare you follow me? He did not find any joy in people being attached to him. And then he goes on to say, I thank God, verse 14, that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, that no man should say you were baptized in my name. Now, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. There are some believers, when they are converted and want to take water baptism, they would like to be baptized by some particular Christian leader. And Paul knew there was a danger of people being attached to him. And there were probably people who were converted in Corinth who said, we want Paul to baptize us. We'll wait till Paul comes and let him baptize us. Now that's carnality. And Paul knew that and so he steered clear of that and did not baptize people. He asked someone else to baptize these believers so that they would not be attached to Paul. And that's good wisdom for Christian leaders, a good example for Christian leaders to follow. And he says further, Christ did not send me to baptize. He says, I didn't get a calling from Christ to go around baptizing people. I believe in water baptism is essential for all born-again believers, but not something that's going to get people attached to me. In baptism, you're not baptized to a particular congregation 
or a particular group of believers or a particular individual. Who baptizes you is not important. The thing is you're baptized unto the Lord in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see here, Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel. He says, my ministry is primarily to proclaim the gospel, the good news. And the good news can save you from all this carnality. You haven't understood the good news properly, and that's why you're still remaining carnal. And he says, this good news Christ has sent me to preach, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ should be made of none effect or seem an empty thing. And that teaches us that even though we may be preaching the pure gospel, verse 17, it is possible for us to preach the gospel with human cleverness. Now in the world, human cleverness is appreciated. A clever physics teacher or a clever mathematics teacher or a clever politician or a clever businessman or a clever orator, all these people are appreciated. The way they can speak, their eloquence, their cleverness, their intelligence. But in God's work, eloquence, oratory, human intelligence and cleverness are not only of no value, it would not be enough to say that they are of no value, here this verse tells us that they can be a positive hindrance to the preaching of the gospel. I wonder how many people realize this, that cleverness of speech can be a hindrance to the proclamation of the gospel, if God's spirit is to work. Because cleverness of speech is a human thing. You don't have to be spiritual to be clever. You don't have to be spiritual in order to be eloquent as an orator. So anyone who is gifted in this area of eloquence or human cleverness need not think that his abilities are going to help the furtherance of the gospel. Quite the contrary, if he does not learn to put them to death, his abilities can be a hindrance to the gospel. Just like the righteousness of the Pharisees hindered them from coming to Christ because it was a human righteousness. That's why Jesus said to them that the prostitutes and tax collectors who were stealing had more chance of getting into God's kingdom because they didn't claim to be righteous. But those who claimed to be righteous had a problem. In the same way, those who are clever and those who are capable humanly speaking, in eloquence and oratory, actually have a bigger problem in preaching the gospel effectively with the anointing of the Holy Spirit than others. Because they will have a tendency not to depend on God, but to depend on their own ability. Now, Peter was not such an eloquent man, but Paul was. He was a great scholar. And Paul, therefore, stood in greater danger of not depending on the Holy Spirit than Peter. Peter would be cast on God, but Paul was in danger of leaning upon his own abilities. And therefore, he had to speak about this more than Peter. Peter doesn't speak about human cleverness in his letters because he wasn't battling that in his own life. But Paul speaks much about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 because this was an area which he was battling in his own life and which he had overcome. And that's why he could advise the Corinthians on that, because among the Corinthians were great scholars, among those believers, some of them anyway, and people who thought that it's only through cleverness of speech and human ability and eloquence and oratory that the gospel can be preached effectively. Let's never be impressed by a man who can speak cleverly or eloquently, because when that is done, it says here, the cross of Christ is made of none effect. How is that? Because the cross of Christ is meant to put to death not only all that is sinful, but all that is human and not divine. There is that which is evil, demonic, and there is also that which we can call soulish, human, substandard as far as God's standard is concerned. And the cross of Christ is meant to put to death everything that's human so that the pure divine life and nature can flow forth through us. But this word of the cross, verse 18, he says, is foolishness to those who are perishing. Those who are in the process of being destroyed, those who are on the path to hell, they cannot understand the message of the cross. And there are many 
believers too who haven't understood the cross in its deeper aspect of putting not only the flesh to death but the human soul power manifested in cleverness and eloquence to death. It is foolishness when they hear such a message about putting human cleverness and eloquence to death. But to us who are being saved, and that phrase teaches us that salvation is not just a once for all thing, there is a salvation from judgment once for all, but there is a continuing process of salvation from sin and from human soulishness. To us who are being saved, there is only one way by which the power of God is manifested, and that is through our accepting the message of the cross. Through death to self, we experience the power of God. Blessed are those who have years to hear and understand this truth.